In other words, if you look at the 25%, that 25% says in 2008 to 2009, 25% of the households that were in the lowest 20% moved up in one year. So he's even a better guy. <laughs> so how many want to pay the 50%? Or some below that. To enforce a rule like that would create the IRS in the United States and Revenue Canada are plenty intrusive already. Do we really want them so intrusive? Which, which again, again, we can dig into that if you want the question. The first myth was the idea that the cost of living has risen over the 20th century and into the 21st. And I argued that, in fact, most goods have never been cheaper than they, than, than they are now, uh, with a few exceptions. The second myth was this idea that we're sort of running out of res natural resources and, and between losing, you know, running out of resources and population growth, that, that we don't, more people, fewer resources, that whole set of problems. And there I argued that, in fact, for most resources, we're not actually running out for oil. We have more oil now in provable reserves. Uh, reserves than ever before. And we know from the history of these things that, um, that when, uh, when markets are allowed to work and prices of resources rise, when they get more scarce, people tend to find substitutes and, and explore new sources of the resource. And the third myth was the claim that uh, women make 77 cents for every dollar that men make. And in that case, I talked about the sense in which that's true, which is on the average, that's about right. But when we look at individual men and individual women, that most of the differences between men's and women's wages can be explained by differences in their labor market characteristics and the kinds of training and skills they have, the kinds of jobs that they like, uh, and, and also uh, the, the experience they have with particular kinds of jobs. We cannot deny the fact that women graduates are rising in number, mm -hmm. numbers at North American universities and altogether in general. Yeah. Um, McGill, for example, is now 52% women and 48% men, whereas a few years ago, four years ago, that was actually reversed. Uh, given the fact that increasingly women have the same human capital as men, do you anticipate better wage equality as well in the future? Yeah, yes, but here's the two big buts to that. Um, one of the big buts is the total level of education is one thing, but as we were talking in the last session, the kinds of degrees that, that people have and the kinds of choices they make about what kinds of education they get and experience and do they do internships and these sorts of things matter too. So it's great that we see the equalization, if not women being you know, more college degrees, but to the extent that those degrees are still in areas that, are low, that will end up being lower paying, my guess is the gap won't you know, go away. It'll, it'll shrink, but it, won't, but it won't go away. So part of the story is, is, is number of college graduates, but the other part of the story is what kind of fields are they going into, uh, what kind of, uh, you know, are they continuing to work full time, how are they thinking with potential partners about child care or having children, I mean all those other set of questions that we're talking about. All other things equal, more women in college should narrow the gap. But, the question, but to make a substantial impact, it's going to matter what they do and the choices they make. Due to it being becoming more more difficult to find and more scarce, again, you know the numbers that we were just talking about. We have, tr you know, trillions of barrels of oil out there. Um, the reasons for the rise in the price of oil probably have much more to do with either a the sort of flood of U.S. dollars into the market through quantitative easing and all this other stuff, or b just again increase in demand. Oh, actually, three reasons. The second reason: increase in demand from around the world. China, India are industrializing. They continue to put significant pressures on the demand for oil. But the third thing to keep in mind with the price of oil, at least in the short run right now, is uncertainty in the Middle East. We've got you know tension in Iran and the Strait of Hormuz and all that kind of stuff. And anytime there's political tension in the oil producing countries, we tend to see the price of oil rise. So you really got to look at this over the long haul and sort of see what's what's not, you know, looking at over the sort of months, two or three months or something like that doesn't really give us the big picture because that's always going to be affected by these short-term political issues mm -hmm. like, like what's happening over there. Okay, and you emphasized um, the possibility of looking more into, into alternative sources of energy. Yeah. Do you anticipate uh, both parties emphasizing this? Well, I think they're going to talk about it, right? But, the, but what you really need to do if you want to talk about alternative energy sources is, again, as we, we talked about in this session, stop subsidizing oil. Let the price of oil go to where it should be on the market. If, it, if Without the subsidies, if it really jumps up, that, that's all the encouragement people need to lo look at alternatives, uh, alternative energy. I mean, it's not like, you know, automobile companies would love to produce an electric car that actually worked and you could drive for more than, you know, 
20 miles or something like that. So, so the incentives are there, but the higher the price of oil goes, the greater those incentives will be. And by keeping that price of oil artificially low through all the subsidies, we, we discourage the development of alternative Ron Paul has developed quite a following and during the Iowa caucuses was considered a top contender. Uh, can you please explain the rise of the libertarian movement in the United States? Oh, uh, I can try. And a follow up to that afterward is does massive government spending um, have a large part to do with the rise of the libertarian movement? And secondly, uh, well, let's let's first hear your position. Okay, on sure. Um, I think I think the best explanation uh, for the rise of the libertarian movement is two things. Uh, one, I actually think that massive government expenditures is part of it, right? That uh, that that I think uh, young people in particular, two things are happening. Young people have always, I think, rejected the Republican Party's the United States sort of social conservatism. And they see in Ron Paul someone who you know, has talked about, say, legalizing marijuana, um, in general thinks that the government should be out of people's lives both economically and these other places. So I think he's appealing on those ways. Um, but at the same time, I think he appeals to their sense that uh, we have overspent and, and maybe we're overtaxed. And that sort of, uh, I think young people also recognize the kind of freedoms they have in the internet and other kinds of places to be created and do their own things and sort of glimpse that this is how economies work too. So I think the combination of, of, the sort of a generation that's used to being free and the idea that if you let people do what they want under the right kinds of rules, good things will happen, and a sense that the sort of generations of politicians have spent and borrowed us into oblivion, um, that in Ron Paul they see someone who gets all that, uh, and, and, and in general libertarianism. The other thing I'd say about the libertarian movement United States is that there had over the last 20 years we've seen a remarkable growth. Of people like me, sort of libertarian faculty at universities in the states, um, and libertarian think tanks and organizations, and, and more and more students have come to their to the programs, come to programs like we're here today for here in Canada, uh, and have been exposed to those ideas and find those ideas to be attractive. And so, when you the great thing about the world of ideas is when you start to put people out there with those ideas, they stick and they spread and they grow. So I think the combination of the ideas being out there, plus the debt you know, uh, and, and spending issues, plus a generation that sort of gets it, like, you know, if when you leave people alone and let them be free to do what they want uh, peacefully, good things happen and that's cool. Well, the eventual Republican nominee, uh, if he is not Ron Paul, do you anticipate that he is going to try to um, appeal to libertarians? That's a really interesting question. I, I, I sus certainly not if it's Rick Santorum. Uh, maybe Romney might move that way. But the, the question, though, is that remember, in the way it works in the U.S. during the primaries, right? You have to appeal. You know, you figure out how to appeal to the Republicans if you're those guys. But once you're in the general election, if anything, you're going to maybe move a little bit the other way on economic issues. It'll be very interesting to see.